Welcome. This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Great. Well, without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speakers this afternoon. Um, so beginning with Judge Dennis Londine. Uh, Judge Londine brings 20 years of judicial experience to his ADR practice. As a judge assigned to the Mandatory Settlement Conference Program, uh, he holds a distinguished record of success in settlements and earned recognition for his ability to resolve even the most intractable disputes, encompassing complex issues in nearly every area of civil law. In addition to his settlement work, um, he's had a strong track record of public service, having begun his legal career as an attorney for the Legal Aid Foundation of Long Beach, providing legal help and representation to low-income individuals in housing, consumer, and immigration matters. And then he moved on to the Federal Public Defender's Office afterwards. Um, having represented people from all socioeconomic backgrounds and even served twice as a juror in state court, um, along with his tenure on the bench, Judge Londine's unique experiences have sharpened his skills as a formidable attorney, a sage judge, and now a spectacular neutral um, who is able to appreciate all sides of a dispute and approach matters with empathy and insight integral to successful settlement. Thanks so much for joining us today, Judge Londine. Um, and our other speaker this afternoon will be Judge Nancy Seltzer. Uh, as an esteemed judge, trial lawyer, and litigator with a wealth of practical experience in all aspects of civil litigation, um, her highly successful 45-year le legal career, um, I'm sorry, over her highly successful 45-year legal career, Judge Seltzer has demonstrated impressive levels of skill and intuitive insight into litigation, earning the respect of colleagues as an approachable yet practical authority in the legal field. Her extensive litigation experience includes serving as partner in the Labor and Employment Practice Group at Lewis Brisbois, Bisgard and Smith, and as a member of ABODA. As a litigator and trial judge, Judge Zeltzer has represented both public, uh, I'm sorry, trial lawyer, Judge Zeltzer has represented both public and private entities and their employees, as well as elected and appointed officials. Um, and she is received the Orange County Chapters Trial Lawyer of the Year Award as a litigator, and then received this organization's Judge of the Year Award in 2020 as a trial judge. Thanks so much, Judge Seltzer, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I will go ahead and pull up our slides here and hand it over to the two of you. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Great. Katie. Thanks, Katie. So let's go to the uh, first slide with the agenda. So in the next 50 minutes or so, we're going to define some terms. We're going to talk about implicit impl implicit bias uh, in the court and legal system and how we might be able to reduce the impact of bias. And uh, not only that, why we should try uh, to do that. OK, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, well, actually, we don't have to go to the next slide yet. But uh, one of the challenges of teaching a class like this is that we don't know who is out there. Uh, the only thing we know is that your last name probably starts with the, the first letter of your last name starts with an H and, and or up until M, and you have probably not taken this class. Uh, we suspect, however, that uh, many of you know quite a bit about this topic, either from the nature of your practice or personal experience or personal study. Uh, and you could probably teach this class, right? On the other hand, we also know that there are some lawyers out there who uh, question why this is now required and wonder whether they can get anything out of it or whether you know it'll do them any good. I know that uh, many judges felt that way when we were first directed to take uh, classes like this on eliminating bias in the court system. And I get it. The word bias is quite negative. And uh, it's sometimes used as a softer term in place of prejudice or uh, racism. And no one wants to be put in that category. 
Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask Nancy to uh, def make, give us some definitions of what implicit bias means for purposes of this class. Uh, Nancy, let's go to the next slide. All right. Thank you, Judge Landine. Look, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And now evening, we are now in the final act of a very long day, I'm sure, for you all. And I'm hopefully it was a very informative and interesting day. And um, I welcome you to my fake office. Uh, you can tell it's fake because it's really neat. If I start looking up at the top of the screen because I'm looking at myself, if I'm looking down here, I'm looking at my notes because believe it or not, I did not memorize this information. So what I'm gonna do at this point is sort of talk about sort of the nuts and bolts. What is implicit bias? Implicit bias describes the automatic association that people make between groups of people and then stereotypes about those people. These automatic associations can influence our behavior, making people respond in a way that is biased, even if we are not prejudiced. Now, one question you may ask me and ask both Judge Landine and myself right off the bat is, there is so much explicit bias in the world today. Ancient you know, rivalries and tensions are exploding. There, there was a frightening cry, rise in hate crimes and increasing anti-Semitism with all this going on. Why should we be worried about some biases that we're not even aware of? And the reason is this is because these biases, these implicit biases, they advantage certain groups of people while disadvantaging others. These biases can be seen in university admissions, uh, in jury, in job recruiting, recruiting, sorry, and selection in the classroom, and significantly here today, as we're going to talk about in depth, in the legal system. By recognizing the potential impact of social biases, we are taking steps to overcome social stereotypes and therefore discrimination and prejudice. Next slide. Slide, please. <laughs> well, what is an implicit bias? Uh, the, the key reason we develop such biases, and this is where I can get a little technical, is that our brains have a natural, uh oh, I may have missed a page. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Nope. Um, a key reason we develop such bias is that our brains have a natural tendency to look for patterns and associations to make sense of a very complicated world. The Our ability, our brain's ability to store, process, and apply information is dependent upon the ability to form associations uh, about the world. Essentially, our brains take shortcuts. Because the brain is constantly being inundated with more information that it can con conceivably process, mental shortcuts make it easier for the brain to sort through all this data. While people might like to believe that they are not susceptible to these implicit biases and stereotypes, the reality is that everyone engages in them, whether they like it or not. This, however, does not mean that you are necessarily prejudiced or inclined to discriminate against other people. It simply means that your brain is working in a way that makes associations and generalizations. Dennis, um, why don't you go ahead and share with us the origins of the split, if I say explicit, I'm making a combination between the two, implicit bias and training for judges, which I think kind of started this all off. Sure, and if we can have, have the next slide, let me start by uh, uh, putting on the screen here, a section of the uh, section of the California Code of Judicial Ethics. Uh, judges are obliged to perform their duties without bias or prejudice, right? Um, and so, uh, <laughs> the history of this bias training or anti-bias training goes back to uh, about 2004, 2005. And one of the proponents of it uh, was Judge uh, William McLaughlin, who was um, who, who retired about five years ago from the LA Superior Court. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Judge McLaughlin, he was appointed many, many years ago by a very conservative Republican governor. And I, I think he's Republican himself. Uh, if you're out there, Bill, I, I'm sorry if I got that wrong. In any event, um, he belonged to, and I think still does, the Cowboy Lawyers Association, whose members, and I, I think I got this right, uh, love horses and the Old West. Uh, not the kind of person you would think that would be involved in this kind of training, but uh, about the time he was the presiding judge in LA, which is I think 2004, 2005, 
a movie book, uh, came up entitled Crash, and it didn't have to do with vehicles. Uh, it had to do with homophobia and uh, ethnic tensions in Los Angeles County. And uh, it, it won Academy Awards, and if you haven't seen it, you should. Uh, people my generation probably have seen it. The younger folks, you know, get it on, you know, Hulu. Uh, in any event, uh, after seeing that, he and other folks uh, wanted to figure a way to make sure that the court system, in particular in LA, wasn't exacerbating the problem, right? So he, uh, Judge uh, Fumiko Wasserman and Judge Kevin Brazil made a presentation uh, about bias and, and it, Back then, we didn't, we weren't even talking about implicit bias, but uh, eventually it came up. Um, now, I should say that um, a lot of judges didn't want to go to it, right? And they, they were saying, "Well, I'm not biased, right? I'm, and even if I am, once I put that robe on, it's not going to be a problem." Um, in any event, uh, the program went forward, and uh, it, it got very good reviews. And uh, that was, and that was at a time when the LA bench. Uh, or the bench in, in the whole state of California was not as diverse as it is now. In any event, the class was taken on the road and eventually the Judicial Council uh, made this a requirement for judges. So judges have to take this kind of class on a regular basis. Um, and they're looking out for uh, manifestations of bias. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later uh, when we talk about jury uh, issues. So we have some obligatory information that we're obliged to present. And a lot of that uh, is based on social science and materials put together by some other ADR as neutrals. Uh, I think it's Anne uh, Sambold and Wayne Bowler. I think that's how he says his name. But we also plan to talk about some developments in the law. And we'll give you some commentary based on our many years wearing the robe. So Nancy, where does this bias come from? All right, so as I talked about, our fabulous brains are constantly striving to sift and categorize mountains of information that make up our human experience. But where do we obtain the information to create these categories? This information can be based upon our experiences, our cultural conditioning, media uh, excuse me, portrayals, and upbringing. These can all contribute to the creation of these categories. These influences are particularly powerful if one doesn't have personal experiences with the subject of those stereotypes. With respect to our upbringing, think about what attitudes you absorb from your parents and other family members. We don't just absorb our skin tone, our eye color, our hair color. Well, that changes all the time for some of us. Um, but we also absorb their views, their opinions, their, their interests, et cetera. Unfortunately, children can also learn prejudice from their parents by hearing their parents raging about immigration or hurling invectives or dropping the odd racial slur. Um, but we also inherit our family story and our narrative and our views about life. This is a personal example. I am a descendant of European Jews. And uh, from a very young age, I would hear my parents and very much my grandparents uh, who were, were again from Russia and then from Germany and Poland, but well, not too many from Germany, but mostly Poland and Russia. They would talk about the Holocaust. And even as a little kid, I became terrified of, of the topic and, and what I was learning from them. And as a result of that, and from their views, I developed the opinion that there must be something wrong with German people. They must be at heart defective in some way, or else how could they condone or stand by as these atrocities were committed against Jews and against all kinds of marginalized people? And I remember as a kid, I mean, at my parents' house or my grandparents' house, we lived in Michigan at the time, and I was reading Grimm's fairy tales. And my grandpa came up to me and uh, he spoke, he spoke English pretty well, but he also spoke mostly Yiddish. And he grabbed the book and he said, you can't have this. And he just took away because it was a book about written by a German. Um, my parents and my aunts and my uncles and cousins always said, I'll never drive a German car. Never, I've never. Well, that 
lasted a couple of decades, but uh, my parents uh, were very happy to take us out in our VW buses for many years. And my mom's last vehicle was a baby Benz that she was so proud of. Akin to influences based on our is cultural bias. Differences in cultures, different cultures may have different histories um, or experiences of oppression or exploitation um, or colonization or migration, which can affect, affect how we view ourselves and others. For example, some cultures may have internalized stereotypes um, based upon these cultural influences. Um, of course, the other matter, uh, the other source I mentioned was the media. And of course, the media is just legion in its, its um, you know, propagation of stereotypes. Now, yes, there have been improvements over, let's say, maybe approximately the 50s uh, to now, where there has been great attempts to uh, integrate and to eliminate demeaning stereotypes in television and moving pictures, et cetera. But it's still the case that the predominant features in our films and in television are white males and that um, people from other groups are subordinated or erased into roles such as sidekicks or villains or sexual objects. Of course, social media, the tsunami that is social media amplifies implicit bias by reinforcing existing prejudices and spreading misinformation and reinforcing harmful stereotypes and also enabling online harassment. And this wasn't in my notes, but I was going to add this. Our political discourse, the raging conflict uh, that is, that is you, you cannot ignore it involving immigration and uh, the rights of marginalized people, it's, it, it's all there and it's all adding as fodder to this creation, even without our knowledge of these origins of biases. Now, another point I wanted to make at this, this sort of the nuts and bolts area is that there's many types of implicit biases. In fact, there's apparently 17 types, but we're only gonna talk about four. Oh, next slide, sorry. Let's see, we should have a slide up. coming up. There we go. Uh, so we only have four up here, but I'll just I'll just reference these. Stereotype biases, bias, that's what we're mainly, uh, excuse me, mainly going to focus on here tonight is that this is a bias with respect to any particular group, um, based upon stereotypes. Confirmation bias is a bias um, that favors information that confirms your previously existing beliefs or um, biases. Confirmation bias impacts how we gather information, but also influences how we interpret and recall information. For example, People who support a particular issue will not only seek out information that confirms that issue, but they will also interpret news stories in a way that supports what their belief already is. And they will also remember details in those articles that reinforce their pre-existing beliefs and ignore the rest. Just think about the different, you know, the variety of different political views espoused on our, on our are in the news and interesting what one person might hear one story from one channel and another story from another channel get completely different impacts or, or, or assessments of it and it's because you're looking to confirm one one thing is what you're doing is looking to confirm what you already believe turning pages Affinity bias is basically a bias for people that you you have an affinity or would rather be with people who share your 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 interests, your backgrounds and experiences. Uh, because of this, we tend to feel more comfortable with people who who are like us. We also unconsciously reject those who look different than us. Benevolent bias, which sounds good, but but not so much, is when we limit an individual or a group's autonomy because we know what's best for them. That sounds good, but the problem is what we think is best for them is based upon these stereotypes that we have inculcated, you know, from, from these origins as I previously described. And these stereotypes, it may not be valid. 
They may be inaccurate or even inapplicable to the situation. So why doesn't, next slide, sorry. So why does implicit bias matter? Why does it matter? In general, it matters because biases cause us to act and treat others in a way that we do not intend and which in fact we would despise if we were consciously aware of it, of this behavior. Not only does society benefit from the elimination of implicit bias, you, important here today is you as lawyers, you will in a very real world and important sense also benefit from eliminating these biases to the best of our ability. Dennis, how does implicit bias come up in a legal setting? All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this shouldn't surprise anyone when you, when you see this list. It comes up in jury selection, in uh, criminal justice issues, recruitment and hiring, et cetera. Um, and I'll just let me give you an example that I read about in preparing for this class. Uh, law enforcement get a call about an active shooter in a big box retail store. Uh, there's no description uh, of the shooter. Uh, the the uh, police arrive at the scene and see people fleeing, just running out of the front door. Some enter the building and see a middle-aged woman coming down the aisle. Uh, they tell her to stay low and exit the building to their left. And as she walks towards them, she shoots two officers. So the officers wrongly assumed that the shooter was a male, right? Or another way to look at it uh, is that a female couldn't possibly be the shooter. Now, they were operating in a very high stress situation. They weren't thinking about sexism or discriminating against men. They had to make a very quick decision. And sadly, in this case, they got it wrong. Now, what's a high stress situation for attorneys? Well, being in trial is pretty stressful. And I would submit that being in trial before a very difficult judge during jury selection is as well. And so we're going to talk about that a bit. And the trial lawyers know uh, what I'm going to be saying, probably. Uh, but non-trialer trial lawyers should know this too. Uh, if it's clear that someone can't be fair or is not suited for the case, the judge is going to kick that person for cause, right? Uh, but apart from that, uh, attorneys do have the right to remove a certain number of jurors without stating any reason whatsoever, except what? You, you, you trial lawyers know. You can't kick someone off based on their race or ethnicity. And uh, this was a holding back in the mid to late 70s in People versus Wheeler. And then the Supreme Court adopted that same rule in uh, Batson versus Kentucky, where they observed that a lot of prosecutors were kicking a lot of black folks off. And uh, the Supreme Court finally put an end to that. Uh, now, those were criminal cases, but uh, there were later Supreme Court cases that now apply this to civil cases. Uh, in any event, now, uh, someone's race or gender may be the furthest from your mind when you and your client get a gut reaction or a gut feeling that a veneer person is just not right for your case, right? But if opposing counsel alleges that race was the reason for you your, for your use of that challenge, a judge may have to engage in a process to determine if you purposely discriminated against that veneer person based on race or ethnicity, or uh, whether you had a race neutral reason for the challenge. Now, uh, hearing the allegation from the other side is actually quite upsetting. Uh, and I've seen it happen because I conducted quite a few criminal trials and civil trials, and, and I've seen this happen. Uh, people will get really upset, but apart from that, it really disrupts the flow of the case. And the judge is now in the position of having to decide if your gut feeling is just a pretext for a challenge based on race or ethnicity. Now, look, in my experience, most of these uh, bats and wheeler objections, uh, when they were made, it, I think it had more to do with maybe this implicit bias playing a role rather than outright racial discrimination. But the effect is the same. And uh, Nancy, I know you have some thoughts about this. Did, did you want to share those? I and by the way, I think we're about 526, Nancy, just so you know okay. what the time is. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. All right. Next um, slide, by the way. Next slide. That, that's true. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Dennis. Um, 
when we're preparing for this program, it does cause you to, to think a lot, it, particularly as a lawyer and think about it, the impact of these biases and the on our, and what we do as lawyers. And one of the things that came to mind was the O.J. Simpson case. Now, we're not live, so I can't ask everybody to raise their hand who was a lot who was alive at the time of the O.J. Simpson case. Uh, I was somebody that really followed it very avidly. I watched it on a little TV in my office every day. But what I wanted to say about it was. One of the big things about the, the you hear a lot about the OJ case is, oh, the prosecution screwed up right from the beginning because they allowed this case, which involved a black man, a very famous OJ Simpson, big football player. Um, they allowed this case to be moved from venue uh, from from uh, Brown, excuse me, Santa Monica, where it was originally venue because that's where the crime took place, to downtown L.A. It was moved to downtown LA because that was better equipped to handle it security wise and logistic wise because big trials, big high publicity trials took place there. So the prosecution agreed, yes, it must be moved there. But I can't tell you how many times during that time period, and even to this day, you heard legal experts, media folk, people on the news, many lawyers I worked with, many that I knew would say, that was terrible. The prosecution blew this case right from the beginning. They shouldn't allow that to happen. And at the time, thinking about it, I thought, I really did think that was a racist opinion. Because what the subtext of that was is that, well, you're going to transfer this to LA. There's mostly Caucasian jury pool in Santa Monica, but in downtown LA, it's going to be primarily people of color. And people of color, they are all going to vote for the black man because the same race. And they're also going to be distrustful of the police, every single one of them. They're not going to be, you know, receptive to police, you know, testimony. Uh, they won't be sympathetic to the victims in this matter, matter, entitled white people. So that's why the lawyer shouldn't have allowed the case to move. Think about this now under Batson Wheeler. If any lawyer tried to exercise peremptories just on those assumptions alone, what would happen, Judge Landine? Well, uh, <laughs> they would not be allowed. Yeah, would not okay. be allowed. And yet that was the prevailing opinion at the time is, oh, those prosecutors messed it up. Of course, OJ was acquitted. So um, we should go to the next slide and then the next slide, actually. Uh, OK, we put this up because this is the codification of Batson versus Wheeler, basically. And we didn't put all the different groups. But uh, I wanted to focus on one particular portion of this. And that's the, the portion that says, uh, or the perceived membership of the prospective juror in any of those groups. <laughs> so this may take some lawyers a, a by surprise. Uh, you may not think that someone falls in this group. but. But if opposing counsel can make an argument that you just kicked off the fourth Latino, right? Uh, even though you, need, you didn't even think that person fell in that category, you may be in a Batson versus Wheeler challenge. And uh, so it's always a good idea uh, when you're picking a jury to question your first impression about a juror, uh, especially one who might fall or arguably fall in one of these categories. And let's go to the next slide because uh, this uh, slide shows all the different categories that are, that are applicable in discrimination, employment and housing discrimination cases. So it's it's broader actually than what's involved in uh, Batson versus Wheeler. On the other hand, I wanna focus on uh, this disability and physical or mental, uh, I'm sorry, disability, colon, physical and mental. Uh, that's not one of the uh, groups listed in that uh, statute I just mentioned. And if we have time uh, at the end of this program, I'll get more into a particular case. But uh, the short version is a uh, in, in the face of a Batson Wheeler challenge, a lawyer said, Judge, I didn't kick that person off because she's Latina. Uh, I kicked her off because she has a disabled person living in her home. And the case was a medical malpractice case and the uh, plaintiff became disabled after a botched operation. Uh, the, the Court of Appeal in that case decided that that also fell under this protected class. So uh, you, you, we all have to be aware of the potential that we may be walking into a Batson versus Wheeler challenge. And indeed, and I think we have 
another slide here that that talks about this. Can we go to the next slide, please? <laughs> so, uh, Nancy, do you want me to? Yeah, okay. So, uh, what we have here are reasons that I used to give to federal judges when I kick someone off a jury. And you might be using these reasons now. But effective uh, January 1, 2026, um, Nancy, tell them what would happen if they use one of these reasons. Well, if you, these are, uh, this list here, excuse me, this list, if there's actually 14 uh, presumptively invalid reasons. So what does that mean, presumptively invalid? Um, that unless you have clear and convincing evidence to overcome that presumptive presumption that it's invalid, you're going to fail with proffering that a reason. Proffering that reason, you can see these reasons here. I won't read them all, and I was just going to add a few from the uh, statute. So one that kind of surprised me, what specifically expressing a distrust. This is number uh, distrust or having a negative experience with law enforcement or the criminal legal system. I just don't know why that would be presumptively invalid, but maybe I'll learn a little bit more about that someday. The same with number with the next one, expressing a belief that law enforcement officers engage in racial profiling or that criminal laws have been enforced in a discriminatory manner. Now, some of them, uh, I guess the main point of this is, as I said, there's 14 of these Xerox, oh, nobody says that anymore, make a copy of this page, Put it on top of your uh, trial notebook, your binder, the where you have jury selection information, so that you know that if you're planning to use any of these excuses, probably not going to make it. And and I should add to that that we're talking about when you've just or you're thinking about kicking some off someone off who's in a protected class, right? Right. Uh, and if a judge thinks that there's some pattern here that you're doing that, and then but you give one of these reasons, it's just not going to work unless you come up with something else. Um, so, Nancy, uh, what can we do about implicit bias? Let's All go to right. the next slide. Next slide. That's the question. Let's go to the next slide. What can we do about it? Well, this is a great quote from James Baldwin, and it's a perfect quote for this uh, this lecture here today because, because the first step in doing something about implicit bias is we need to face ourselves to eliminate these biases. Next slide. Next slide. Self-awareness. And we do talk here on the screen about self-awareness. I'll just add a little bit. Look inward. This is just sort of thoughts on this. Look inward to identify your own potential of biases. And that's scary to do, but it's 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 a way to, to, to get a handle on this. When you identify an implicit bias, re, and this is what I think is important, reflect on its origin, origins and challenge the validity of the validity of the bias. Seek out and analyze the origins of a stereotype and think about them. And this is one example I was thinking about. Let's say you find yourself having a bias about a particular group, group believing that you're they're uneducated or they lack drive to get ahead in life. But think about why does that stereotype exist? Maybe because that group of people, because of past discrimination or past prejudice, was denied access to education or denied access to equal employment. That's where maybe that stereotype originated. And it'll give you a different way to think about it. And you start thinking about the individual people in front of you rather than that stereotype. Need the next slide, I think. All right, thank you. All right, there's these tests to identify, and I don't know how many of you have taken again, we can't raise hands because it's not, not that arena. Um, these tests, there's a number of online tests you can take to test your implicit biases. They're not like, you know, necessarily absolutely true or absolutely not true, but they're a good tool to help you identify your biases and then have the opportunity to reflect on them. Uh, the IAT basically, it's like takes 10 or 15 minutes, you take it online, and it has a, a series of images and words, as well as a questionnaire. And what you're required to do is sort of answer yes, no, good, bad, things like that. Um, and what will then happen is that the test will be evaluated, or your, your answers will be evaluated. 
and the results will indicate whether or not there may be an automatic preference and it'll be graded like none, slight, moderate, or strong, basically an, if an implicit bias is present. These results, as I say, can help us understand and reflect upon our actions and decisions and attitudes that could, that could be related to discriminatory practices. Uh, there's a very interesting video entitled Hidden Injustice. Uh, it was a video we were hoping to show, but it's not going to have enough time. But um, Judge Landine is going to talk about some of the highlights of it. Sure. And if we could have just the next slide. Um, this was put together in about 2016. And uh, Professor Kang from UCLA and some other professors uh, kind of headed it. Um, there, the, it, It's only about 10 minutes. I urge every one of you to see it if you haven't and show it to your office staff. Uh, but the highlight I, I wanted to uh, mention is this. So there's a judge, a U.S. District Judge named uh, Mark Bennett in Iowa. He's Caucasian. And when he was a young man, uh, a young boy, actually, his mother died suddenly. And he was raised by an African-American woman who he considered his second mother. He became a civil rights lawyer, represented a lot of uh, minorities, especially African-Americans, and uh, became a district court judge. He took this test that Nancy just mentioned, and it, he was shocked that he scored as having high implicit bias against African-Americans. So what he did is what any good lawyer would do. He uh, challenged the validity of it, right? So he spent a whole month doing some research, and he confesses that he, he concluded that, you know what, I, I think there's something here. So uh, uh, look at it. Um, uh, take the test, but look at this video too, and I think you'll be motivated to see uh, how you would score. Um, and in the interest of time, we'll just keep going here. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, let's talk about uh, self-regulation. Like, in other words, what can we do to overcome uh, these biases that we have? Well, um, let's start by mentioning a few social uh, uh, science studies on implicit bias. And they tell us that our biases are actually malleable and can be changed, right? But we gotta make the effort. Uh, I suspect that there are many of you who have acknowledged some bias you had in your younger days and uh, that bias no longer influences your, uh, your worldview, right? And, uh, you know, I, I, I've had my own <laughs> biases too and I've changed uh, over time, which is great. Uh, and uh, I want to mention that the research shows that uh, the desire to be fair can actually uh, change implicit attitudes uh, that we might have. If we start thinking about others uh, as equal to us. Now, uh, we should try to control our influence impulses, right? And then acknowledge it's gonna be hard. Uh, and then ask yourself uh, why you are having certain responses when you might see someone that uh, uh, is completely different from you, or maybe their behavior is something that you don't approve of. And uh, I'll tell you one instance that, that I'm still struggling with. It's, uh, and it goes back to something I did when I was uh, in the criminal courts. I had a criminal defense lawyer ask me if uh, I would order the sheriff to allow his male client to wear a dress and makeup at the jury trial. And uh, I wish I would have taken this class before because my reaction at the time was not very pleasant. And I just assumed that this was a ploy and uh, you know he was trying to pull one over on the eyewitnesses. But once I learned from the lawyer, this person's background, I, I actually felt really bad. Uh, so, so, you know, if you have those reactions, uh, pause, take some time, think about it. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Here's a couple other thoughts. Um, and I'm going to focus on number three, because I think I mentioned number one and two. Uh, whether we like it or not, uh, based on movies uh, and streaming programs like Better Call Saul, Lawyers are not well regarded in the general public, right? Uh, 
you know, those shows are very entertaining, but they don't paint real, a realistic picture about lawyers. But, you know, there's a bias against us as well, right? So we all need to be part of the change here and inspire confidence uh, in the legal system. And we should do our share to prove that it is fair and equitable. Now, um, Nancy, what do we do when we're, we're making these efforts, but we see folks who are not? That's a good question. And I had, uh, well, not a hands-on experience, but sort of a second uh, phase uh, ex experience. And we need that. a next slide. Oh, next slide, please. Um, and Nancy, we're at about five. Oh, okay. I'm just going to say, I used to work at Lewis Brisbois, uh, Bis well, Lewis Brisbois, let's just call him that for now. Um, and I worked there about 25 years and I was a partner. I left in 2014 to take the bench. But unless you're living in a bunker underground, I don't know why you would be, but if you, unless you heard, you must have heard about the Lewis Brisbois Barber Rain and Scandal. And it basically involved two real prominent big giant book of business partners, employment law partners who left the firm and uh, they took with them, you know, in, in a little basket with them about 140 employment lawyers. This is a big giant firm, but that still is a lot. And they started this new firm. There's a lot of hoopla, a lot of you know, media and all this about it. And then what happened is like maybe three days later, Louis Brisbois, the, you know, jilted law firm, they, they published this tranche of emails from Barber, John Barber and Jeff Rainin with all these vile, you know, racial slurs, slurs about women, about gay people, about Jews, Persians, Armenians, didn't matter. It was just, you know, these just terrible emails and why Louis Brisbois released them, I don't know. Um, but it, it was just, a, you know, a bomb going off. It just, it, it destroyed that new firm. Um, it it um, that fell apart. They kind of tried and reunited. I don't know if they've got anything still going left. It turned all these young lawyers who flocked to join them with their families and all, just they're now collateral damage. But Louis Brisbois wasn't unscathed either. These partners had worked there for, uh, well, these emails have been going on for at least a dozen years. And they just didn't go back and forth to each other, but they shared them with other associates and with partners and, and with staff and all, you know, not with staff, but basically the attorneys, but a lot of attorneys, and no one said a word. So what was going on there? Um, clearly to me, it was, and I never got any of those emails. I, I, I'm sure I was the subject of some of those emails, but I, I never received one. Um, it was the imbalance of power. These these guys had you know the power to give these these lawyers work or take it away from them. These lawyers had families and you know lives to support, so no nobody spoke up, not even anonymously, um, which is something else to consider if all else fails. The higher ups there, did they know about it? Who knows? Maybe they're afraid to. If they did know about it, maybe they joined in those feelings and those opinions, or maybe these guys were just you know, too big to chop away from this firm because it would have meant the loss of millions of dollars. So the bottom line here is how did all that silence work out? Not so good. Yep. The, the new firm was destroyed. Reputations were tarnished. All these young lawyers were left stranded. And Louis Brisbois itself is looked on, you know, with somewhat of a jaundiced eye. And it's going to last for a while. So when you see something, you say something. That's an old adage. Bigotry flourishes in in silence, in, in the face of silence. When I was a young woman growing up in the 60s and 70s, we used to have an ex expression. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. When you hear something like this, when you observe something like that, be part of the solution. Speak up. Don't be part of this continuing problem. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And we're going to go through these quickly, Nancy, because we only have a few minutes left. Um, Social scientists tell us to work on developing cultural competency. So uh, briefly, uh, expand your network, right? It, in college we did, uh, but as time goes on, uh, I think for a lot of us, because of family obligations and maybe specialized uh, practices, it, it our, our, we may have more of a narrow network. So let's go to the next slide, um, please. And uh, so here's some things you do, you know, be curious, take time to learn about uh, other folks. And when you go to bar events, 
sit with folks you haven't seen before who might look different from you. Go to the Armenian bar event in Glendale. I mean, they have probably the best food you'll ever have. Uh, or go to a bar, uh, so an ethnic bar association that you've never thought of before. And just, you know, sit uh, at a table as a stranger. And uh, I bet you'll leave with some friends. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of you folks will probably pick up on this particular concept. So we want to get to the last part, which is pretty important here. And that is, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, Nancy, I'll just start and then let you segue into okay. this. Uh, in addition to not discriminating uh, against folks so when you take on clients and things like that, uh, you are running an operation, right? Even if it's, if it's a small outfit, but you're obliged to make sure your staff doesn't go down this road. So Nancy, what are the things that the uh, uh, these folks can do to make sure that their organization is, you know, making an effort to detect yeah. this bias? Yes, let me just go through, through uh, some of these. These are some things you can do to help your organization and avoid things like discipline, as we just talked about in the last slide. Educate your employees about implicit bias and encourage them to be mindful of stereotyping behaviors. Let employees know that you are priori prioritizing bias elimination. Include a diversity statement in your uh, organizational values or your mission statement and in your employee handbook. Be open about your hiring and promotional practices. Assure your employees that these processes are not biased. This is really important. Have clear criteria for evaluating qualifications and performance of employees. Having such clear criteria nearly, well, nearly eliminates all possibility that will impact, that bias will impact the appraisal process. Make meetings inclusive. Be aware of, as, as um, Judge Landine was just mentioning, be aware of you sit next to, engage with, with each meeting, engage with each meeting, ensure equal amounts of interaction with each employee. Offer a means for making anonymous complaints. That's what supposedly happened in Lewis Brisbois. Um, make sure you're obtaining feedback. Include questions about racial bias or other types of bias on anonymous employee surveys. Check in with prior employees who are of different you know, backgrounds and ethnicities and racial, uh, racial uh, categories and ask them, how did you fare here? How could we improve? Or do that even with your current employees? These are just some of the ways you can help your organization eliminate let's, the best amount possible uh, implicit biases. Let's go to the next slide. I think we have one minute left. It's good for business. And I'm gonna, for those of you who didn't see the article a couple of weeks ago in the Jewel Labs case, Judge Oreck in that case, it was a MDL, a multi-district litigation case. Uh, he wanted to know if the legal work uh, was being handled by a diverse staff and generated an order that required lead counsel to make quarterly reports. He was concerned when he saw the reports that not very many women were conducting the depositions. Now, fortunately, that firm had a very good explanation for that. They, they were actually conducting the depots of the most important witnesses. In any event, the judge was satisfied with the response and uh, the attorney fees award, I believe is $130 million uh, and probably growing. So follow those steps that Nancy just mentioned and uh, maybe uh, you'll be able to uh, achieve uh, uh, more of a cultural addition to your staff rather than just looking at a cultural fit. So um, Katie, our, our, did our time run out? <laughs> You know, we have just about 10 minutes left. Um, oh, I, oh, I'm sorry, you I thought... had some questions, didn't did I think we had some questions uh, building up here. Maybe we could oh. answer some of those. Okay. Um, um, well, hang on. I, uh, I was looking at a different clock, but that, that allows me to go back to that um, uh, jury, uh, uh, the Batson versus Challenge case. Uh, oh, yes. So that's, I have a, a last slide on that, but you don't- Yes, you do. I can pull them up. So um, the sad thing about that case is it went up on appeal twice. And uh, the uh, uh, the claim was by, by the uh, plaintiff that the defense, the defense lawyer in the Medinal case was kicking folks off who were Latino uh, because the plaintiff was uh, Latina, right? Um, and so uh, the judge said, no, I don't see any discrimination here. But the Court of Appeals said, 
The judge didn't do a, a proper inquiry, so went back to the trial court. And that's when the lawyer said, uh, Judge, I, I didn't kick her because she's that ethnicity. It's because she has a family member in there. And the judge at the time said, okay, that's fine, and let it go. The trial went forward, and uh, verdict for the uh, defense, I believe, and the uh, case was reversed, a new trial was ordered because uh, the Court of Appeal, and I think it was Division 7, decided that uh, disability or someone's association with a disabled person is a protected class. Um, okay, so uh, Nancy, I think there was a question there that we can answer. Um, let's see, a good lawyer, this one here? A good lawyer. Whatever you want to do. Oh, okay. There's a good a lawyer probably would not want a deeply religious evangelical to serve on a jury that decided whether a woman was guilty of an illegal abortion. Well, that is true. Um, it, that, that brings me to the thought that keeps coming through this. As, as a trial lawyer myself, I wanted to mold that jury in the sense that I wanted to you know, be, be like a, a sculptor. I want to carve away the pieces that I didn't want, even if they hadn't expressed outright you know, I can't be fair. I wanted to carve them away and end up with what I want. And so that's what peremptory challenges are for. But this probably would not pass muster because it's based upon the your, your belief that a deeply religious evangel evangelical would not be sympathetic to in this case. Maybe they would be. It would take your examination to determine whether or not there was sufficient for a challenge for cause. But I don't think that passed muster. But Judge Landeen, what do you think? Well, uh I think it's going to be a close case, and I think uh, it's going to just be more challenging for lawyers because some judges are in a hurry to pick a jury, right? Oh. And they're they're really limiting you. And just so you know, in federal court, at least when I was there, I was able to ask questions only once, and I was involved in ninety trials. And that was Judge Robert Takasugi who let me do it because he knew oh, I was yeah. appointed, and as a favor, he let me do it. But uh, Look, uh, in state court, we're obliged to give uh, lawyers more time. And you're going to really need that time to make sure uh, that you could convince a judge. No, it's not because of a religion judge. It's because uh, she's she's acknowledged that she just can't be fair in this case. And if once you can get the juror to say that, you know, you're, you're, you're golden, whatever race or a, religion she is. I was wanting to add a thought there. And, and uh, Judge Landine and I talked about this with these restrictions that operate, uh, when they touch upon these protected statuses, they operate in one way, when a protected status is not involved, they operate in another. So I start thinking, like I said, about these peremptory challenges, do we really need them? I mean, they're not, I mean, as a trial lawyer, I wanted them because it allowed me to be a sculptor to that extent. But um, I don't have the quote right in front of me, I have it somewhere in my note. Justice Kennedy once said that, you know, the the you know, jury selection marks the beginning of trial. If it is infused with discriminatory challenges and behavior, or, you know, on the part of the attorneys, that then creates a, a, a lack of faith in the entire trial itself. And it's not that far-fetched that we would eliminate peremptory challenges. In 2021, Arizona, poof, Supreme Court eliminated them all. I would be interested to, you know, I'm not trying cases anymore, but I wonder what it'd be like to try a case without peremptory challenge or peremptory strikes. As a judge, it would kind of delight me because as Judge Landine, especially during the pandemic, all I could look at was that clock, that clock, that clock. I mean, I, got, you know, I, it was so hard to keep a jury there, let alone drag it out. Anyways, that's, that's my input. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, by the way, here's, here's a question. Do do judges tell jurors about implicit bias, Nancy? Uh, yes, there is a, a jury instruction on that. I think it's uh, 113, is it? I don't have the text of it, but 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 they do. You know, you're not supposed to let this and this and that, you know, sway your um, um, your, 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 your opinions and, and your verdicts in this matter. But yes. You know, we have a procedural question about uh, preemptory challenges on the subject of that. Um, so if a judge sustains an objection to the use of preemptory challenge, what happens? Uh, well, having sustained those types of objections, uh, both in a criminal and civil sentence, uh, setting, I could tell you that there are a variety of options. Uh, the 
the one that's in, I believe, in the upcoming statute and one that's often used is you discharge the entire panel and start over. Now, if it this happens early, it's not that big of a deal. But think about uh, uh, the second or third day of jury selection, especially during during COVID. Do you want to start over, right? Uh, uh, the last case I had where this came up, and it was a civil case where I sustained the objection, the uh, uh, I think it was a defense lawyer that made it. He wanted me to seat that juror. And indeed, that's what I did. Uh, I sat that juror. Now, the juror never knew that uh, this Bats and Wheeler thing was going on and that there was some allegation of uh, racial animus. But uh, that's one of the options. You could actually seat that juror, uh, which makes it a tough role to hoe for the, the lawyer who, who uh, wanted him or her off, right? Uh, Judge Seltzer, have you had any experiences with the, the Batson-Wheeler experiences? Uh, when I was in uh, at a criminal assignment, I had uh, Batson-Wheeler challenges somewhat often. Uh, when I was on the civil assignment, I, I had a couple of cases where they were just constant. I had just towards the end of the time I was on the bench. Well, no, actually, it's towards the beginning when I was in the civil. Uh, there was a case involving a very similar, or the, a police police brutality case of a black man who was suffocated to death um, as a result of um, his interaction with the police. And it was going on at the same time, you know, the George Floyd case was going on. Every, I mean, almost every peremptory that the process, that the plank, excuse me, the defendants exercise came with the challenge. But by the time I observed, they said, well, they're striking all the people of color. And I looked at our jury because the demographics of Orange County are changing. And I'm downtown Santa Ana. I said, you know, half this jury is people of color. You, you, you know, you, you're going to land on them. Um, so it was, it was challenging and it was during the pandemic. So it took a long time. And, um, but I, you know, it's important. These are, you know, we're trying to eliminate, society's trying to eliminate these biases and we want to eliminate them in jury selection, but sometimes they do clash with the desires of the lawyers to, like I said, sculpt a jury that's best suited, not for their personal biases, but the interests of their clients. Mm -hmm. We had one uh, time for one final question. Somebody had a clarification question here. Um, you mentioned a case where the judge questioned the staffing or demographics of the attorneys taking depositions. Um, they wanted to confirm what, what case was that that you mentioned? Sure. Uh, it's the Jewel Labs case before Judge uh, Oreck. And the firm is Leaf Cabrazier. The, I believe they are the lead firm in that matter. And uh, I had a chance to talk to Sarah London, who gave me some the backstory. And if we had more time, I'd love to share it. But the bottom line was uh, they were able to explain to the judge uh, why more people of color weren't doing certain tasks. And a lot of it had to do with the timing and the other work that these folks had. And so Judge Warwick was quite pleased with their efforts to uh, use folks. So uh, the takeaway for me is that uh, federal judges who could do more than state judges uh, are pushing this. Uh, and I know some state judges are also uh, taking efforts in, in certain counties where urging folks to let uh, young associates argue maybe half of a motion in order to increase uh, diversity at the higher ranks of a law firm, right? Uh, you know, so we talk about work assignments you know, you got to think about those early on in some young person's career. If you don't give them the right assignments, they're not going to be able to do that big deposition or pick that jury. And it's just going to uh, limit them, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it is about time here to close up um, perfectly here at six o'clock. I want to thank you both so very much for this program. It was super interesting. A great way to close out the end of our day. Really insightful. And I appreciate your, your dedication to this topic and to putting on this program this afternoon for us. ADR Services, Inc. has been your unwavering partner in alternative dispute resolution. But as the world changed, so did we. From virtual and hybrid hearings to our ongoing on-demand CLE program, ADR Services, Inc. continues to keep resolution and legal education at the forefront, woman-owned and operated 
from the start. There is someone for every situation. We are ADR Services, Inc.